This next panel is a more specific application of some of the general principles that were uh, addressed in the uh, panel that we just finished. When uh, Tatham was first developing the privacy policies that then uh, led later to the adoption of the rules that were operating under, uh, Social Security cases were cut out with different treatment than all other kinds of cases uh, so that Social Security files were available at the courthouse and were not available uh, electronically over the patient system. And then as it went on through, immigration cases got added to uh, that so that immigration cases now are handled like Social Security cases. And one of the questions is whether that should be uh, done that way. So, uh, what adjustments, if any, should be made to the way they're uh, handled. So we've got uh, a panel of some people with a great deal of expertise in the immigration area to uh, address it. And the first speaker we have is David McCaw. He is the Vice President and Assistant General Counsel of the New York Times, a job that I think probably 90% or maybe 100% of the people uh, at some point in their careers have aspired to. But a great thing to, to do, uh, David. I guess I'm happy they don't reveal, but I get paid and that would cut that number down. Um, <laughs> that's why we have part of this by the private. Uh, Dan very wisely invited Nina Bernstein to be here today, who is a New York Times reporter who covers immigration, on the theory that you probably will hear from a lot of lawyers today, you should hear from real people. Um, Nina, uh, to her great good fortune, being honored this morning in Washington at the American Society of Newspaper Editors for her coverage of immigration, and so to completely uh, reverse cable from Dan, she sent a lawyer in her place. Uh, so. Uh, she is, did prepare remarks for me to begin uh, highlighting yellow. Terrible mistake comes up in the first paragraph uh, and concludes with how many times government officials tell their privacy is important uh, right after someone's died in detention. Um, I'll try to give a lawyerly uh, uh, loss to those remarks. Um, under under the, as most of you know, and I came to learn as I prepared for this, uh, uh, the Rule 5 2 does a carve out, as, as Judge Hingle suggests, um, for um, uh, immigration cases where you have electronic access at the courthouse or the whole docket outside of the courthouse. You, you're limited to the docket itself, orders, um, and, and, and other dispositions. It's our view that, that this. Uh, attempt at, at, at privacy, in effect, does neither serve neither of the public policy goals that are implicit in that. It neither protects privacy very well, nor does it uh, bring the kind of transparency the court system should have. Uh, it is, in, in effect, a version of what you heard in the last panel of practical obscurity. In my mind, practical obscurity is actually a code word for elite access. It is a method by which we decide that certain people in this democracy should have greater access to information than others. And we do that by making sure that people can't hire private investigators, who can have lawyers to go down to the courthouse, who live far away, who are disabled, who don't know how the system works, don't have access. And to me, that's fundamentally a very, very bad approach to transparency. Um, I think it's also a bad approach to privacy if you look at how it actually plays out. Um, I looked at about three months of Southern District filings and immigration cases just using PACER. And what you can see when you go onto the system is the orders and the decisions. You can see uh, dispositive, uh, air, sorry, you can see certain orders on scheduling and so forth. Um, and so by reading, and you know who the, the litigant is, you know who's seeking asylum, you know who is objecting to a deportation, and if you look at the online decision, you can find out a great deal about the cases. What you don't find, and what you can't get, is the habeas petition, and what you can't get are complaints, usually in the nature of mandamus. And those are very, very important for people like Nina, who are trying to find out what's going on in a system that, on the administrative side, is shrouded in secrecy. So when they pop up into court, that there is a chance to understand what the complaints are about, what mistreatment is being alleged. Very important for her and for others like
like for, for researchers to see that and to see not only individual cases, but to see patterns. Um, Nina came to poignantly realize how the system worked when she wrote a story about a woman whose name is, is, is Zhu Ping uh, Jiang. Zhu Ping, um, the Chinese, uh, 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 the Chinese woman who came to the United States. In China, um, she, of course, did what is unthinkable. She had a second child. Uh, therefore, she was being subject to mandatory sterilization. She came to this country, and um, she was being deported for violation of the law. During her hearing, the judge asked her her name. She responded twice, giving her name, not waiting for the Mandarin translator. The judge thought this was some example, the administrative judge, thought this was some example of bad faith, that she was responding in English rather than waiting for the translator, and said, I'm going to treat you if you did not appear. On that basis, um, fortunately, she had relatives here who were able to find a lawyer in New York to her case. Um, now, her habeas petition would never have been known uh, and never been reported on, except for the fact that it was misfiled. And then it was then found, except that um, Ji Peng happens to have the same name as the former wife of the guy who shot up the Binghamton Immigration Center last year. And so while they were looking for, they were doing stories on him, they came across for filing. It had been this file, it had been filed publicly and was available remotely. Um, my point here, uh, rather obvious, which is it shouldn't take a mistake for people to know about that and to write about that case in cases like it. In the next we have Professor Daniel Hamstrom of Boston College. He's the director of the Immigration Asylum Clinic and the director of the International Human Rights Program uh, at Boston College. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And particularly, I was heartened to hear Judge Raji describe herself as a Brooklyn girl. I should say that I'm a Brooklyn boy, and I, I'm happy to be brought back from the diaspora that we call the Red Sox Nation. <laughs> I'm going to speak from the perspective of both the theory and practice about immigration law, an area that has sometimes been referred to as standing in the same relationship to civil litigation as mud wrestling does to the Bolshoi Ballet. Um, and I was asked to, to talk about the bar's bar on remote access to immigration cases. Uh, my understanding is that the bar was motivated by two background principles. One, a concern for sensitive information, and the second, a concern about volume. Uh, I think these concerns are certainly significant and in some cases uh, compelling, but uh, my ultimate conclusion, which I'll get to in a minute, is guided by a couple of fundamental principles that I would disclose as a suggested way of thinking about this. Um, the main principle, as again others have noted, it seems to me, is a general background norm of openness, which I think is mandated by the First Amendment, also due process and some deep common law traditional principles. So I would suggest that we start with this as a tiebreaker model. I often tell my students in administrative law that when you have these kind of tectonic conflicts, which you're seeking some sort of tiebreaker principle, and I think the principle here ought to be a presumption of open access. Um, those who have concerns about openness, in my view, bear burdens of both production and persuasion, and I think those are heavy burdens. In immigration cases, especially in deportation cases, they're particularly heavy due to a couple of other principles that derive from the nature of the cases. First of all, as the Supreme Court has recognized just recently, reiterated in the Padilla versus Kentucky case, deportation, while not technically a criminal punishment, is a severe penalty. Uh, stakes are very, very high, sometimes literally life and death. So I think we ought to look to the norms of criminal cases for some sort of analogous guidance. And these are, I think, for the most part, norms of open access, <coughs> certainly not categorical bars. Another principle is the legendary, sometimes humorous, sometimes uh, teeth gnashing complexity of immigration law. One court referred to it as an area that would, quote, cross the eyes of a Talmudic scholar, end quote. Another, an area of law where morsels of comprehension must be pried from mollusks of jargon. Complexity, um, <laughs> just a context I think matters, because the exact boundaries of these rules are, to my eyes, rather unclear. 
I couldn't tell reading this rule, and I have to say I, I was struck by this, whether it would cover a case like, for example, Hoffman Plastics, which is a Supreme Court case that dealt with the intersection between the National Labor Relations Act and immigration law. It's not entirely clear to me whether these rules cover all habeas corpus challenges, particularly if they're just focusing on the conditions of detention, naturalization appeals. These cases arise in a wide variety of contexts, and I fear the rule as drafted may be uh, overbroad. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it is. Um, finally, as our president likes to say, let me be clear. Um, in certain types of immigration-related cases, the privacy concerns are quite compelling. Asylum cases, Convention Against Torture cases, S cases, visa cases, uh, T trafficking victim cases, U visa cases, perhaps. But it seems to me these require more protection than the rules give. So it seems to me that the rules are uh, overbroad in light of the background norms and certain realities, but maybe underprotective in others. Um, the overbreadth, I think, also relates, as uh, David was saying, uh, and as I will. Uh, validate the tremendous value that's brought by close public scrutiny to these cases. Uh, it's really made a huge difference for a variety of reasons, which if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to talk with you more about. The second feature of the system that I think should be highlighted is the prevalence of transfer and detention decisions. Um, this is a powerful concern. Uh, many thousands of people each year are arrested, placed in deportation proceedings, and then summarily detained and transferred from, say, Massachusetts, where I've experienced it quite a bit, or New York, to Texas or uh, Louisiana, where the cases proceed and where judicial review, if there is any, follows in that district, in that circuit. So remote access to these cases is incredibly important and incredibly difficult. We have to actually go to the courthouse to get it. I, I apologize to anybody who lives in either Texas or Louisiana, but for those of us practicing in Massachusetts, in New York, I think it's the common problem. So the rules, as I said, are overbroad, and as I noted, they also seem underprotective in some cases. And this can inspire this underprotective aspect, a dangerous and I think false sense of security. I wouldn't want people to think that these rules are sufficiently protective in the cases in which more protection is warranted. I think all of this amounts to a call for greater nuance and texture in the rules as they're drafted. Um, one last issue which, which comes up a lot in discussions about this, and that's the question of volume. I think volume is a major problem. I'm not quite sure how it compares to Social Security or other areas of law. I think it has disparate impact in certain circuits than others, more in the second and ninth probably than the fifth and the eleventh, maybe a little less so in the second and the first. Anyway, it, it is a concern, but I think it should be historically understood. The volume of appeals into the judicial system rose in the early 2000s for a general uh, set of reasons, a confluence of three factors. One was vastly increased workplace and security, post 9-11 related immigration enforcement. The second was vastly increased, and to my view, and actually I, to the view of the Supreme Court, rather over enthusiastic criminal slash immigration enforcement, a second type of deportation case where the person is being deported because of criminal conduct. The court on that score, by the way, has ruled in a series of cases nine to nothing, eight to one, seven to two, that the government theories in those cases uh, were wrong. So there's a vast number of cases that are not going to be prosecuted as aggravated felonies anymore. The third factor is the reduction in the size of the Board of Immigration Appeals that was uh, championed by John Ashcroft. None of these things are true today. So the administration has stopped the workplace raids. As I say, the Supreme Court has rejected DOJ's legal theories in this series of cases, and resources are now properly being redistributed, redirected to the Board of Immigration Appeals and to the IJ. You can go to the website of the Executive Office for Immigration Review to see some statistics on this. And I should say I'm also on the uh, Immigration Commission of the American Bar Association. We've just released a, a major report about this, calling for certain further reforms, to highlighting the reforms that are already taking place. So I think this volume concern is actually going to diminish, and I would bet it already has diminished as the quality of administrative adjudication has risen. Um, in any case, the volume cuts two ways because volume indicates that it's a sort of tsunami that bears watching deportation, and this is my own uh, academic work on this has, has been in that line. So in sum, the general exemption of immigration, especially deportation cases from remote access, seems to me to require much more substantial justification than I have yet heard. 
Certain types of cases clearly do require protection. But given the harshness of deportation, its convergence with the criminal justice system, the complexity of the law, the lack of counsel for most deportees, and the prevalence of detention and transfer policies, it seems to me that the costs of general exemption seem much greater than the potential benefits. Thank you. And then next we have Eleanor Acer. She is the director of the refugee program at Human Rights First. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Human Rights First works in partnership with lawyers at, at law firms in New York, Washington, and, and other places around the country to help provide legal representation to asylum seekers who are indigent as they navigate their way through the asylum system. That's at the asylum office level, before the immigration courts, and sometimes before the federal courts as well. We also advocate with the U.S. government uh, to see that uh, U.S. asylum standards are in accordance with our, our obligations under the 1968 protocol relating to the status of refugees and other international human rights standards. Uh, asylum has a long history in this, in this country. Um, to some extent, the pilgrims uh, are viewed as the first individuals to come here seeking uh, some kind of protection from persecution. Um, the U.S really led the international community in setting up a regime in the wake of World War II to ensure the protection of those who fled from persecution. Uh, in 1980, the U.S. Uh, enacted a law that actually created the status of asylum, and that law actually just celebrated its 30th anniversary last month. So, um, by way, I'm giving you a little bit of background just to sort of set the stage for the importance of maintaining confidentiality and some protections for confidentiality in asylum cases and in similar cases involving withholding of removal due to refugee status um, and uh, withholding of removal under the Convention Against Torture. I actually agree with any of the points raised by my uh, colleagues, uh, my fellow panelists, so I agree this isn't an easy thing to navigate, but I think it needs um, some closer examination. There have been a number of reasons um, that I'll touch on for the importance of maintaining confidentiality in cases involving asylum and similar relief. One is, of course, the potential for some kind of retaliation against an individual if they're returned home. Another might be some kind of harm to family members um, or other colleagues who may actually be still in the country of persecution. Um, in addition, asylum applications often involve very confidential uh, types of information being, being uh, disclosed. Um, and finally, another reason that actually isn't talked about in, in, in some of what I looked at, but the very nature of an asylum application requires people to be honest. Um, and to be honest, they have to understand about very intimate details about things that could affect the lives of other individuals. And so the assurance of confidentiality is actually incredibly important to people and important to the um, strength of the asylum system so that people really do provide accurate information and are not scared uh, to release information that's, that's important. Uh, U.S. regulations, as some of you may know, actually have specific protections for confidentiality in asylum cases. These regulations appear in two different places. They appear in um, 8 CFR 208.6 as well as 8 CFR 1208.6. And the reason they appear in two different places is that when um, uh, the Department of Homeland Security was created in 2003, responsibility for asylum and other immigration matters rested not only with the Department of Justice, but also with the Department of Homeland Security. So um, as a result, these regulations are sort of essentially mirror regulations appearing in two different places. Um, ACFR 208.6 says that information contained in or pertaining to any asylum application records pertaining to any credible fear determination, pertaining to any reasonable fear determination, shall not be disclosed without the written consent of the applicant except as permitted by this section or at the discretion of the Attorney General. Now, um, under the Homeland Security Act, that, that the discretion is um, actually rests with the Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, there is an exception um, for any federal, state, or local court in the U.S. considering any legal action, um, including that arising from the proceedings of which the asylum application, credible fear determination, or reasonable fear determination is a part. So there are these regulations calling for confidentiality. Um, the instructions actually on the asylum application form inform the individual at the time they actually fill out the initial asylum application that the information collected will be used to make a determination. Um, it may be provided to other government agencies for purpose of investigation, etc. However, no information indicating that you have applied for asylum will be provided to any government or country from which you claim a fear of persecution. 
uh, and then they cite the regulations. So why does this matter? Uh, I can tell you why I think it matters, and I'll, I will a little bit, but um, I'm going to cite the Department of Homeland Security for why it matters. Uh, there's a fact sheet that was prepared um, and that is posted on the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration uh, Services website prepared uh, for those in the asylum division who actually adjudicate asylum cases. And in both the first paragraph and, and the first of the frequently asked questions, USCIS uh, explains the reasons why the regulations protect asylum-related information. The fact sheet says that public disclosure of asylum-related information may subject the claimant to retaliatory measures by government authorities or non-state actors in the event that the claimant is repatriated or endanger the security of the claimant's family members who may still be residing in the country of origin. Public disclosure often can, uh, also can, in, in rare circumstances, and only if the individual could meet the, the standards, uh, give rise to a, a potential asylum claim in and of itself based on uh, potential for persecution based on the release of that information. Um, the Fourth Circuit has actually cited um, to, to this particular demo um, and its explanation of why this is important. Um, so too has the, the Second Circuit. Um, I'm just also going to read briefly from uh, the policy of the UN Refugee Agency. Um, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, uh, was actually created before the 1951 Refugee Convention. It's um, the United States is a member of the Executive Committee of UN, UNHCR, and I think is also one of the primary donors. And UNHCR has explained in its policy memo, in its policy, a policy letter, that the nature of asylum proceedings call for strict observance of the duty of confidentiality. Um, uh, the UNHCR itself has a confidentiality policy for all the refugee status adjudications it does across the world. Um, as a general rule, UNHCR will not share any information with uh, the country of origin. Information relating uh, to the applications needs to be kept strictly confidential. And, and the, the letter goes on for several paragraphs about the importance of this. So, just practically speaking, um, for people who've actually applied for asylum, many kinds of information are disclosed in their asylum applications. It could be um, uh, very personal and sensitive information, the details of an individual's rape, their torture, um, the rape or torture of their family members or colleagues, uh, details uh, about um, sexual or gender identity, for example, or another individual's sexual or, or gender identity. Also, the kinds of information that can be released sometimes include the names of individuals who helped them escape, names of other individuals who participated in prohibited political activity with them, individuals who are members of an underground church. Um, often during the asylum process, it's, it's important to identify how other individuals who are similarly situated are treated, and adjudicators will want names, specifics, dates, information to test corroborate, to, to test uh, credibility, etc. Oftentimes, the very fact that a person has applied for asylum as well can be viewed by a persecuting government um, as an act of, of treason, or at least as a, a blatant criticism of the government and their human rights policies to the United States government. And this, of course, was you know more publicized maybe in the days of the, you know, the height of the Cold War, but it's still very much true whether we're talking about China or Iran um, or many countries where state and non-state persecutors um, may you know, target individuals for a wide range of reasons. There are various examples of these, but I'm running over my time, so <laughs> I won't go in, go, um, go on and, and talk about this. But I have to just really thank you all for inviting me to, be, to participate in this panel, because I actually did not realize that this was such an issue of, of discussion. And, and in just doing the looking at this, I realized, I realized there's actually a dearth of information out there about this issue, and then there needs to be a lot more attention to it. To it. Uh, thank you. And then next is uh, Elizabeth Grumman. She is the Director of Legal Affairs and Senior Staff Counsel at the Second Circuit. Thank you, Judge. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me. I also think that uh, it's important that I make a full disclosure that I am a member of Red Sox Nation, and I'm seated next to Professor Canstrom in any event. Um, and I'm in dangerous territory being here in New York. From the viewpoint of um, the federal courts, there's two issues that I think are relevant to the discussion here today. Uh, one is the public availability of the A number or the alien registration number, um, and then whether the federal rule 5.2C should be 
examined or what the implications of that rule are. I'm going to address the A number issue very briefly, and I think I'm going to let Mark Walters talk about that in more depth. Uh, and then I, I'd like to focus on the public access portion of um, the federal rule. To set the stage, I'd like to um, explain that for the most part, up until about 2002, the federal circuit courts dealt with immigration cases, particularly asylum cases, on a relatively small scale. Um, prior to around 2002, immigration cases accounted for less than 4% of our circuit's caseload. Within just a couple of years, the filing of immigration cases exploded. And by 2004, 2005, they accounted for almost 40% of the court's caseload. So you can see um, that it increased exponentially um, over a really short period of time. Um, as a result, many people in the court ended up becoming experts in a lot of different areas of immigration law um, as a necessity. As many of you are probably aware who are involved in this field, um, our court tried many different methods of handling the influx of cases, uh, both to address a rising caseload and out of desire to provide a timely forum for the litigants. And ultimately, the court developed a non-argument calendar, which we call the NAC, um, successfully eliminating the backlog. But the, the cases continued to come, predominantly to the Second and the Ninth Circuits. Prior to this time, I don't think a lot of thought was given to um, A numbers or the implications of having A numbers available. However, once the deluge of immigration cases came, uh, it quickly became clear that the only reliable method for keeping track of the thousands of immigration cases that we were dealing with um, was to have the A number utilized to identify um, who the cases belong to. And there's a letter from Molly Dwyer, who's the clerk of court in the Ninth Circuit, addressing this issue and the materials that were given out this morning. Um, there have been some suggestions that the A number should be redacted as a way of protecting the confidentiality of the litigants. Um, but as Molly says in her letter, um, and our clerk of court agrees, that absent a suitable replacement system, that this could really wreak havoc on the courts and the ability of the courts to maintain order of the thousands of cases that get filed. Some of the issues that are relevant with respect to the availability of the A numbers are that um, the names in many of these cases are incredibly sim uh, similar. In our circuit, a large majority of the cases are Chinese immigrants filing asylum. Um, and there has been a lot of confusion in how the names are reported when they get to us, whether their first names are substituted for their last names. Many of the last names are similar. And without having some other identifier, um, like an A number, it would be impossible for the clerk's offices to keep track of um, who the cases belong to. Immigration cases, as you know, can go on for many, many years. Um, they go from the agency up to the circuit. They go back to the agency sometimes many times. And it's an effective way of making sure that the case is tracked properly. Um, clerks are always concerned that somebody may get deported um, by mistake because they were misidentified. So the A number is a way of pre preventing that from happening. Um, the BIA issues presidential decisions with A numbers except in asylum cases. But many cases begin as asylum cases and then turn into something else when they get to the circuit court. Um, courts don't want to be in the business of doing redaction um, for obvious reasons. They don't want to be uh, taking documents that come to them and altering them in some way. Um, and also they don't want to be charged with the awesome responsibility of perhaps um, taking something out that shouldn't be taken out. Um, there's a question of, of what harm um, could come to petitioners as a result of the A numbers being uh, made available. And even some IJs have asked courts to put the A number on their decision so that they can track the case that, that they had when it was at the agency level. So uh, I'll let Mark deal with that more. But that's um, some of the issues that are relevant to the A number. With respect to the federal rule 5.2, um, as I understand it initially, the Social Security cases were the ones that were given protection from unlimited public access. 
because they're inherently different from regular civil cases. They are a continuation of administrative proceeding and the files of which at that level are confidential. Um, moreover, according to uh, the report of the committee when they were discussing this rule, the cases in, in, in social security context are limited or no legitimate value or use to anyone who's not a party in those cases. Um, as you know, with social security cases, they are replete with medical records because the person has to put that information in in order to qualify for the benefits. Immigration cases were included um, in the new version of the rule because they presented similar privacy issues as those in the Social Security cases. Um, as discussed, this federal rule limits access to actual documents at the courthouse and does not permit electronic access other than through the docket sheets and the court's decision. And um, I think as both um, Mr. Pra and as Professor Reidenberg said that um, it ends up being practical privacy or practical security because less people have physical access to um, those records. It's not surprising to me that the media and research academics would want greater or easier access to court documents. Um, I think in, in um, the written materials Mr. McCraw mentioned about judicial transparency, this is obviously a very important concept to the federal courts as well. And um, under this particular rule that the judiciary was trying its best to balance the court's own support of open access to records with the privacy rights of litigants. And as everyone has discussed, from this morning's panel to this panel that it's a very difficult, complicated issue. Um, the rule is not perfect, but it's an effort to balance those two competing interests. In this day and age of electronic availability of just about everything, um, I guess the question is, is this rule an anachronism or is it a euphemism for elite access? Or is it trying to address a legitimate concern that unfettered electronic access to immigration records through the courts can lead to what I think um, one professor this morning said uh, could be data mining, uh, that it would create dangerous situations for petitioners because internet access may allow for private or personal information to go viral. Um, professor Kanstrom talked also about whether immigration cases are more akin to criminal cases and that it would be helpful to look at the rules surrounding criminal privacy um, rules. But criminal cases, as we know, are available um, for the most part electronically. And um, in my view, having read a lot of immigration cases and looked through a lot of immigration records, there are some differences between immigration and criminal cases um, that would make immigration cases more akin to social security type cases that would warrant um, perhaps a stronger look at those privacy issues. Um, as I said earlier, social security cases originate in the administrative agency and then they come right to the uh, federal circuit courts. The administrative record, as Ms. Acer um, so ably described, they're replete with personal information. And there's a letter from the government to um, a judge involved in the uh, beginning process of developing these rules um, about what kinds of records are available. And if you look through, if, you're, if you have the ability to look through uh, an administrative record in an immigration case, you can see that it's not in discrete areas, that this personal information is woven throughout the entire record. In the same way as the Social Security case, um, there are copies of passports, which includes photographs. Um, there's photographs of the individuals and their family members. They have history of their origin, their dates of birth, the addresses where they lived in the country from which they're, they're coming to the United States. Um, there's information about their children, there's often very detailed medical records, there are a lot of different statements because these petitioners are giving statements um, often from the time that they arrive in the United States <coughs> regarding um, torture, domestic violence, gender identification, political dissent, sexual assault, among um, many other issues. And as you know, in, in asylum cases, often what the immigration judge is looking at is credibility determinations. And a lot of times the decision as to whether or not to find the petitioner credible rests upon the information that that person is providing. So if they're providing very little detail, um, then it's more likely that the uh, immigration judge may rule against them. 
um, so that they are, um, it is important for them to provide as much personal detail as possible. Um, okay, I'm just about wrapping it up. Um, one of the problems that uh, our court has experienced is the lack of the quality of representation of um, asylum petitioners. And about 80% of petitioners in our court are represented by counsel, which would sound like a good thing, but many times they may often be better off representing themselves um, than having counsel. And these are uh, retained counsel, they're not appointed for them. And so um, there is some concern that even if redaction rules are put into effect, that um, these attorneys are not going to be providing the kind of redaction that would protect the people who they are filing on behalf of. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Mark Walters is the Senior Litigation Counsel at the Office of uh, Immigration uh, Litigation at the Department of Justice. Thank you, Judge. Um, I've been doing uh, appellate and trial litigation in the area of immigration law for 25 years at the Department of Justice, 20 of them litigating and supervising. And for reasons I can no longer remember, at one point I became the principal point of contact for the Ninth Circuit when there were issues related to mediation, um, you name it. But one of the issues that's important today was records, getting administrative records to the court. Well, as we move toward electronic filing, almost every aspect of that process needed to be looked at again. How are we going to do that? Are the records going to go online? Uh, what is going to be kept from the general public and what won't be? And where we are right now, as you all know, is that you have uh, limited access on paper, PACER, I'm sorry, um, but unlimited access if you're willing to go to the courthouse and look for the file. Um, I'm going to address practical issues related to this. Where we are right now is working, I would say, on a, a number of practical levels. That doesn't mean in the future it can't be improved. My concern is that we're not where we need to be technologically to improve it right now, not today. Um, here, let me deal with the A number issue first. I don't know if the Privacy Subcommittee has received any letters on this issue. But I know the clerks of the various circuits have gotten letters from, from time to time urging that the A numbers be redacted, that's alien registration number, that it be redacted from their orders. Um, I think Elizabeth has given you a number of reasons why they should be left on, common names among other things, but also more than any other area of law, these people are repeat litigants. A lot of immigration cases come to the Court of Appeals twice and they go through the agency two, three, or four times. And you want to make sure you know when you're dealing with somebody, are there already removal orders for this person? Have they already been granted benefits? When the, that individual interacts with the benefit side, USCIS, or even with the, the now defunct INS, they would have done so using the same number. <coughs> their name might be different. There are lots of legitimate reasons. Marriage. <coughs> After you've been here for a while, you tend to anglicize maybe the order of your names or even change the spelling to make it more readable to people in English who are comfortable in English. There's all sorts of legitimate reasons and there are all sorts of illegitimate ones like aliases for criminal activity and things of that nature. The A number sticks like the fingerprint, not quite as good, but almost, and it really helps. It really helps avoid clerical error and in the end, it, it helps prevent wrongful removals or mistaken removals when you have a, a number of similar names. Just to finish on this subject, the Ninth Circuit has hundreds of cases in the last several years where the surname is Singh. Uh, Second Circuit, hundreds of Lynn cases. One of my attorneys accused me of giving her only Lynn cases after I gave her three in a row. It's just a, a coincidence, but uh, I think uh, you get the point. And in some cultures, the, the names, uh, the problem we have with Smith and Jones uh, is, uh, is even more profound because there are a lot of overlap in, in names. Turning to the question of what should be available on PACER, um, 
The points made by Eleanor Acer on asylum are good points. I mean, that's, that's one of the primary reasons not to give public access on PACER. Uh, the, the suggestion has been made, well, um, if you redact these records and then give public access, you should be able to handle this. And the problem there, again, is volume. In the last six years, the number of cases that have gone from the BIA to the Courts of Appeals have ranged from a low of about 7,500 to a high of about 12,300. Um, there's a FOIA unit, just to take an example, at the Board of Immigration Appeals. It takes that unit about two hours to go through an inch and redact on FOIA standards. Um, the average asylum record is four inches thick. So one FOIA officer would have to spend a day with one case to get the average asylum case moved to the Court of Appeals in redacted form. So why don't we ask the, the petitioner's attorney to do it? Well, uh, cases completed in immigration court in fiscal year 2009, 39% were represented. 61% were unrepresented. You, for obvious reasons, you can't ask the alien to apply the, the standards that a FOIA officer gets trained on to do a meaningful re redaction, even to protect their own interests. And they're just as likely to overstep than to do it, uh, to, to understep than they do it. Um, the immigration bar itself, you see how many people are unrepresented? The Ninth Circuit has a pro bono program and makes a large effort to get uh, competent law firms in California to give their junior associates experience in the Court of Appeals by giving them immigration training and get them to take cases. You're going to ask them now to do redaction when they agree to sign on to these cases. What do you think that's going to do to the percentage of aliens who are able to take advantage of the pro bono program? I'm not sure you'd get quite as many volunteers. Um, I want to sum up by saying I think that, that, that uh, there's a, a basic um, goal to reveal as much as possible online, uh, but practical realities mean I think we have to wait for the technology to catch up. And right now, if redaction has to be done manually, uh, we are not there yet given the amount and cost that it would take to deal with up to 12,000 records a year. I've heard the point of uh, taking uh, questions. Uh, I have been asked by the uh, folks that run the program to just start by giving your name and making a transcript. So, uh, oh, yes. Uh, Peter Wynn, um, I just had a question for um, uh, Elizabeth. I had a question for Elizabeth Cronin just in terms of the technology of the access to a Social Security or an immigration file. Um, I did some experiments in Seattle on this. Because my understanding is that if you file, you can act, an outsider can actually enter a, a notice of appearance in a case, an interested party or something, um, and actually have online access to it. It's just not anonymous access. So that, that the parties to the case would know who was watching, looking at the pleadings, but they would have remote access. Could you, I don't, do you, are you familiar with just the technology of the patient system? But I'm, I'm making a mistake, so. I don't know. According to our clerk of court, that um, PACER access is available um, to pretty much anyone who who files, but I don't know about that specific issue. I'm sorry, with respect to an offline case, which is what Social Security and immigration cases are, um, even though it's, there's no access through PACER, uh, the parties have online access. Correct. So a third party who's not a, a party has technologically the ability to identify themselves as somebody who wants of that access and can file as if they were using the same technology the parties do. It's just the parties would uh, be able to see that and see that transparently and be in a position to protect themselves if they wanted to. I just wasn't sure if you were sort of zeroed in on the technological capacity to deal with some of the concerns of the press about online access to these offline records. But the availability of this intermediate system would also allow, to some extent, online access 
on an individualized basis. Can I speak to that a little bit? In, in anticipation of this, I did a little bit of unscientific empirical research, and I started calling around <laughs> some lawyers who litigate nationally in these kind of cases. And a couple of people did mention that, and that made me think that a lot of the problem here is the question of coding. You know, whether we could code asylum cases to protect them at a sort of anterior point in the system or not. And the idea that if we can't, we still have this other problem. And a couple of lawyers, for example, said to me that they were now thinking that all they had to do to maintain access to their cases was not code them as immigration cases, get them coded as habeas or something else. So I think this is a this is a big question, and maybe that maybe there's the kernels of a solution in that understanding. Bob. Yes. Uh, I I'm uh, Jed Richard Tallman from the Ninth Circuit in Seattle, and I want to underscore uh, a couple of points that uh, Mark Walters and uh, Elizabeth made. The letter that Molly Dwyer wrote was written at the direction of the 50 judges on our court who process 8,000 immigration cases a year. And I think about the privacy problems in immigration, the sensitive information in Social Security appeals, the um, sensitive information in criminal cases, we're working on a national security case right now with uh, top secret information. If we have to redact or somehow deal with these uh, problems in each of these cases, it will bring the Ninth Circuit to its knees. And I don't think that the Ninth Circuit is alone. I cannot underscore the practical problems that we have just in getting access the information that has already been partially sealed or redacted before the administrative agency or the court below in trying to get a comprehensive appellate record so that the decision maker is presented with the information that he or she needs in order to make the decision. And you can talk about all of these interim steps to try and protect some of the sensitive information, but how do you describe in the opinion when you're writing the decision, the reason why you decided the case without disclosing that which you are seeking to protect. And I also want to underscore the point with regard to the identifiers. That we just have too many litigants by the same name. We're going to have to give them some kind of a number that's going to be unique, whether it's an A number, a social security number, or a new litigation number. I just don't know any other way to do it. Otherwise, we cannot have any confidence when we put that person eventually on the plane, if they're going to be deported, that we've got the right say who's going back to the moon Yeah, uh, uh, I was what do you do now? You issue the, the opinion where you describe the information in the, uh, say, asylum uh, appeal. That, that opinion goes out and it has the name and it has the information in it. Right, that's exactly right. And you run into the problems that Mr. Fraud was talking about where in the wrong case, that information can have very harmful consequences back in the country that you're going to repatriate the uh, alien. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly have a great deal of sympathy with the practical problems, of course, dealing with paper. But uh, I hope those of you who are civil litigants, attorneys for civil litigants, will share with me sort of the irony, having been in front of judges who tell us, who we explain how hard electronic discovery is, how many documents we have to go through, and having judges tell us, figure it out, the law required to disclose his documents. Uh, you know, the, the fact is, we understand that. And, you know, the, the, these practical problems should not overcome, we take it seriously, they shouldn't be overcome constitutional rights and greater common law values of transparency in the court system. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, Rita Raggi. Um, I, I have a question that asks this panel to think beyond its particular task and may actually uh, get a little bit off Kathy's uh, responsibilities. But when we talk about reacting immigration cases, we're basically talking about creating an exception from the presumption in favor of open court files. And we will hear in the course of today from any of a number of groups who will say, make an exception for me too. And so I'm not sure I quite understand that how the privacy concerns that you've articulated and that I recognize with respect to immigration 
warrant a different treatment from the privacy concerns of other litigants in a variety of cases, from jurors. I mean, you just heard it said that for jurors it's tough. They, they uh, agree this is part of their civic duty. Why isn't that also the answer with respect to any party that comes knocking at the court door? Not suggesting we may not recognize exceptions, but um, why immigration and not, not other areas? I, I think uh, one answer to that is the volume. Um, the, the Ninth Circuit, the last six years, has ranged from 31 to 41 percent of their docket being uh, immigration I'm cases. Sorry, you think that's an argument for sealing or redaction? Or that's, that's an argument why they shouldn't have to be redacted, but rather limited access on PACER should continue with only the attorneys of record having access. Why limited access, though, for this type of case and not others presenting comparable privacy concerns or for jurors who answered a host of private, uh, provided a host of private information to us? Well, I think it's the practical problem with applying redaction rules to that volume of records, coupled with the fact that this would not be light redaction. Uh, as some of my colleagues, our uh, co-panelists up here have uh, indicated, you have, in addition to the asylum case, which is a, a large percentage of the overall immigration cases, you have quite a bit of personal information having to do with, with uh, marriage, social security, selective service, um, medical hardship claims with medical records, um, marriage difficulty, things. Is it a legitimate marriage or isn't it? Um, it? It goes on and on. I think one of the letters in the, in the materials gives a comprehensive list, so I'm missing some things. So I think those two things combine. That it's not a light redaction like you might see in some other cases where there's only a few places in the record where you have to deal with this. It's, it's pretty much throughout, including the exhibits and the volume. So th that, that to me calls for an exception. Um, there are other cases, I think, in, in other areas where, case by case, they might also have the same, some of the same problems, but not the volume issue. Okay. If I can just press my concern, because the committee will undoubtedly discuss this at some length. Uh, I, I'm, in, I'm in there just a second. Before you do this, I've always wanted to say this to a circuit judge. Your red light is on, but you can keep talking. <laughs> <laughs>